Good morning and good afternoon for our European friends and welcome to our discussion on immigration and its discontents, European elections and future policy. My name is Natalia Banulescu Bogdan and I'm the Associate Director of the International Program here at the Migration Policy Institute. It is my great pleasure to introduce our two distinguished panelists today. Uh, we have with us Dimitrios Papadimitriou, who is, of course, the founding president of MPI and uh, currently president of MPI Europe, our sister organization in Brussels. We also have Benjamin Haddad, who is a research fellow at the Hudson Institute, specializing in European and transatlantic affairs and an astute observer of both French politics and the rise of populism in Europe. And before we get started, I just have a brief housekeeping note. If you have joined via our web link and have any problems hearing, uh, please just dial in using the call information sent to you via email. Um, if you have any technical problems whatsoever, you can email events at migrationpolicy.org or call 202-266-1929. We will have a question and answers portion at the end of the call. Uh, you can type your questions into the Q&A or chat boxes on the right side of your screen, or you can email events at migrationpolicy.org, or you can tweet your questions to at migrationpolicy or hashtag MPI discuss. And as a reminder, the audio from the webinar will be on our website later today. Um, you can access that at migrationpolicy.org forward slash events. So, we're at a moment now in Europe and the United States where the interrelated strands of anti-immigration sentiment and populism seem to have captured the public imagination in ways that are new, ways we haven't seen before. But that's not to say that everything about this current moment is new. We're going to be speaking a lot about elections today, in particular looking ahead to the first round of the French presidential elections on April 23rd, and also reflecting on the Dutch elections that took place last month. But we can't forget that populist and far-right parties have been a staple of European politics for more than 30 years, and their success has actually ebbed and flowed over time. What is sometimes portrayed as an accelerating trend can actually be viewed as a more cyclical one. For example, the far-right parties that have caught our attention recently are not necessarily at their peak. Gert Wilder's Party for Freedom actually got a higher share of the vote in 2010 than it did last month, while Austria's Freedom Party and France's National Front had their highest results in 1999 and 1997, respectively. But the electoral successes of these parties is, of course, not the only marker of their influence. Today, we see that nativism and populism is seeping into the rhetoric of traditional mainstream politicians all over Europe as they compete for people who have been driven to cast their votes in favor of radical change. We've also seen traditional political battlegrounds being redrawn. What used to be a contest between left and right, conservative versus liberal, has morphed away from ideology into more fundamental discussions of who we are as a society, which of course is often more easily defined by stating who we are not. Discussions of us versus them, foreigners versus natives, elite versus the common man, local versus global, rural versus urban, and on and on. And although immigration may not be the sole or even principal cause of the structural changes destabilizing societies, in many cases it has become the face of people's fears. It's a convenient scapegoat, more tangible than the nebulous forces of globalization, and also a powerful unifier for what otherwise might be disparate pockets of discontent. So if we take it as our premise that many of these undercurrents I've referenced have long existed in society but maybe have been latent, then the question is, what has happened to spark or activate them and why now? So part of us, our task this morning is to take a closer look at what has really changed and what hasn't, what role immigration plays in these changes, and what we can expect over the next few months and years. So as we proceed, please feel free to submit your questions as they come up through the Q&A box uh, that I mentioned before or by emailing events at migrationpolicy.org and we'll get to them after our introductory remarks. 
So I'm going to give the floor now to Benjamin Haddad, who will, who will start us off and give us some insights into the upcoming French elections. Whether and why Marine Le Pen has a credible chance of becoming president, uh, how we got here in the first place, um, and what this would mean for the EU. So Benjamin, please. Uh, hi, thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, let me start a little bit with maybe a state of the race of the French presidential election. As you uh, know, the first one will be held on April 23rd. The second round, two weeks later, um, the way this works is that you have the first two candidates qualify for a runoff for a second round, and then whoever gets an absolute majority becomes the president. Then you have the parliamentary elections a month later. And so far, though we can discuss this, it might be dif different this time, so far usually the French give a majority to the party that has won the presidential election and they, um, they govern that way. Now, state of the race, it's a weird moment um, because we're stuck between a mix of a two-way race and a four-way race. Basically, you have two frontrunners of the first round at this point, who are Emmanuel Macron, who is a uh, centrist, liberal, pro-European candidate, 39-year-old, who is running on his own uh, party. He was uh, called En Marche Forward. He was an advisor and an economic minister for François Hollande, though he's never been a member of the Socialist Party. Um, and clearly, you know, he was an unknown figure three years ago. His but his campaign has gathered uh, pretty incredible momentum. Uh, so he, he appears to be the, the front runner at this point. He's neck and neck in the first one with Marine Le Pen, the leader of the National Front that we know well, around 23, 24%. In the second round, uh, he would, according to the polls, according to a variety of polls, he would win handily with something like 60, 62% uh, against her. Um, behind them, you have two other candidates who are stuck around I would say between 17 and 1920, so it, 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 it is getting closer, who are François Fillon, uh, the Republican candidate who has been a prime minister for Nicolas Sarkozy for five years, between 2007 and 2012. Um, Fillon should have been the front runner of the race. He was initially when he won, surprisingly, the Republican primary in late 2016, but his campaign has been embroiled in, in a variety of scandals um, uh, that you probably heard about. Uh, he uh, illegally employed his wife as his assistant and his kids. A uh, uh, shady businessman offered uh, him suits. So clearly he has had um, incredible difficulty to uh, get con back control of the narrative. Um, now, despite all this, he has not been replaced. His campaign has gone slightly better in the last couple of weeks than I would say just because by virtue of what we call in France alternance, you know, um, the, the socialists are the incumbents, you know, normally voters, especially as the, the, the outgoing uh, Hollande administration is very unpopular for its inability to reform the country and high unemployment. Um, normally the voters should have turned to the right. I think you have a base around, you know, between at least, you know, 18 and, and 20 percent under which uh, Fillon would not, not get. So uh, he is still around and, and the most more surprising uh, candidate is uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. He's a far-left candidate. He used to be a member of the Socialist Party a while ago, uh, then broke kind of like Die Linke, I would say, in Germany uh, to create a much more um, uh, ag aggressive uh, left-wing party allied with a communist. He's running also on the populist platform, uh, anti-European, anti-NATO, pro-Russian. Um, but he, he's very charismatic, he's a good debater, um, and I think in a campaign that has been embroiled in scandal, he also appears as maybe more ethical than, uh, than the rest of the bunch. So uh, clearly his campaign has been doing very, very well, um, and, and the killing off the socialist campaign, the socialist candidate Benoit Hamon, who uh, was not a major figure of French politics, he's been an education minister under Hollande, and clearly his campaign is struggling a lot, around 8 10%. Uh, behind behind these four, so at this point, you know the second round would be between Macron and Le Pen, but it is still very fluid. They're quite close to the margin of, of error. Um, I would say that um, Macron and Mélenchon, all things being equal, today beat Le Pen handily in the second round. Uh, things are slightly more complicated with Fillon because of the turnout. Um, if Fillon, who has run on a very conservative platform, more conservative than what the Republicans usually do is a social conservative. He, uh, he has an extremely free market uh, uh, agenda in the sense that he is 
you know, really in, in favor of a, a very ambitious plan of uh, pub, um, uh, cutting public spending and reducing the number of uh, public servants by 500,000 uh, to reduce the debt. Uh, if he were to get into the second round, um, he, you might expect a collapse of the left-wing turnout. Um, maybe they will rally at the last minute because in front you still have Marine Le Pen. But um, I would say today the only chances, and once again I say this, all things being equal, you know, provided you don't have a, a major disaster or a black swan in the meantime, which given France's recent history is, is clearly a possibility. But all things being equal, I think the only way Marine Le Pen could become the president is if you have a collapse in turnout. In France, the turnout is generally between 70 and 80 percent at the presidential election. It's been above 80 percent many times. So the only times when Marine Le Pen's party has uh, done very well uh, were mostly local elections or European elections where the turnout is, is much lower. If you have a turnout that is closer to 50, 55, 60, then you know you have uh, you have a more difficult situation. Now, when it comes you know to I would say the the divisions, the the, the divide that have uh, shaped this campaign. Now, I think it's it's been a fairly negative campaign. It's been a campaign that has been risen by scandals um, that has disappointed a lot of voters. Uh, but clearly, what's interesting, especially if you look at the Macron Le Pen divide is that it is exactly what you've been saying. Uh, it is not a traditional right-left uh, division. Marine Le Pen is, uh, you know, does not define herself as, as far right. It's most observers who define herself as far right, but uh, she considers that the, the left, the traditional left and traditional right that um, have campaigned on the same platform, or at least governed on the same platform f for 30 years, the pro-globalization, pro-Europe, pro-free market, she offers a much more protectionist agenda, economic protectionism, and cultural protectionism. Economic protectionism, she is in favor of withdrawing from the European Union, the, the Euro. She's a bit more cautious about the Euro now. She's proposing something a bit more complex based on referendums, but basically the division the is there. And obviously also cultural protectionism. She's running on a, a strong message of national identity. She has repeatedly said that she wants to limit immigration to almost zero. Um, she's using the term secularism mostly as a way to try to negate uh, minority cultures, and especially uh, the expression of, of Islam in the country. And obviously, she's been very tough on the question of, of migrants and uh, refugees. On the other side, in front of her, um, it's interesting because Macron himself is really trying to transcend the right-left divide as well. Um, he comes from the left, but clearly his campaign has been very attractive to a lot of uh, center-right voters. Has been even he's trying to uh, appeal to. Uh, center-right political figures to, uh, to, to rally him. Uh, he has refused to run in either primary of the, the right and the left. And so if you look at the new divide in our societies as open versus closed, I don't like to say globalist versus localist. I think it's more people who see in globalization the opportunity and those who want to shield ourselves away from globalization. Clearly, he's unabashedly the open candidate. He is very pro-European. He's trying to make more of a identity case for Europe, not a, not a technocratic case for Europe. I think it's, it's very interesting when he talks about Brexit that he considers the reason why uh, Brexit won in the United Kingdom was because on the one hand you had people who were making a civilizational argument in favor of sovereignty and British independence, and on the other hand you had shy, you know, people who were making a shy case, sort of cost benefit and technocratic case, saying, well, we're better off because we got a good deal. So you can't win a campaign that way. So. He's really unabashedly pro-European. He's an economic liberal. Uh, he's a social liberal uh, as well. And um, he, you know, if you look at issues of, uh, of uh, migration, for example, he's in favor of uh, welcoming refugees. He's, uh, he's been very positive on uh, what Angela Merkel did in, uh, in Germany. Uh, though this issue hasn't taken center stage, I think, in the campaign, surprisingly. Um, but I think we're probably talking more about um, economic issues, probably about Europe, and once again, we're really mostly talking about the scandals, and I would say, in general, ethical issues of, uh, of the campaign. He has seized a little bit, but in a positive way, of uh, the um, populist narrative. Now, wh why do I mean this? Because I think when we talk about populism, there's, there's two things we have to separate. There's the question of nationalism, and coming back to, you know, 
local identities and protectionism, but there's also the sort of anti-elite uh, feeling that, that can have a, a part of legitimacy in it. Um, Macron clearly is, is uh, not shy in denouncing the, the incumbent political elite and saying that both left and right has, have failed to uh, reform the country for the last decade, that actually the very way it is structured between left and right has made, you know, I would say intelligent debate um, impossible. So he's clearly running on a very ambitious platform also of political renewal. Um, the fact that most of the people around him are new faces, he um, uh, promises to run mostly new candidates at the parliamentary elections that will be held a month after the presidential election. He constantly says that most of the people in his cabinet will be people who have never been um, you know, ministers. For example, just a few weeks ago, the former prime minister, Manuel Valls, endorsed him, socialist prime minister. Um, and instead of thanking him, he said, well, you know, that's great, but I won't govern with him. Um, so I, I think clearly the fact that he's young, that he was virtually unknown from 99% uh, of the French just three years ago, has played very much in uh, in his favor on um, on this. Now, what would be the impact of uh, the election of of one of these uh, one of these people? I think it is clear that if Marine Le Pen is elected, it would be the end of the European Union as as we know it. The impact would be much greater than Brexit for a few reasons. The main one being obviously that France has always played a much more important role within the European Union than Great Britain. Um, uh, France is a founding member, contrary to the United Kingdom, um, but also uh, the UK always had a sort of awkward in and out relationship with the European Union. It was not part of Schengen, it's not part of the Euro. Uh, France is part of all of this, so clearly a European Union with at best a reluctant France and at worst a France that is actually not part of it anymore you know, would, would cease to exist uh, as, um, as we know it. Macron clearly wants to um, uh, run on a on a you know, platform of, of reform, focusing mostly on the labor market, opening the famously rigid labor market is responsible for very high youth unemployment. Uh, I think it's actually uh, quite striking that the National Front gets its best scores in France from the youth. It is the reverse as in the United States. Uh, something like 25, 30 percent of people under 25 in France vote for the National Front. I think the very high unemployment and the Difficulty to enter the job market is clearly one of the main factors. Um, so he's, he's campaigning on a, on a platform more fluidity, probably inspired from the Scandinavian model, saying you know he will also launch a major program of public investment in favor of retraining uh, workers, um, especially workers around their 50s who lose their job and retraining them for um, the new economy. Um, he intends to you know have an agenda of reform. I think in the first six months of his administration before the German election, as we know, will be held at the end of the year. So his, I would say his strategy is try to show the Germans that the French are really making an effort to reform the country and try to get finally the Germans on board for more integration, economic integration of the Eurozone it's in favor of, of a Minister of Economic and Finance uh, at the European level of trying to mutualize more of the debt. Uh, have more redistribution effort at the European level, but he considers that one of the reasons why the Germans are famously reluctant to do so is because they consider that their partners are not genuine uh, in this, and that they're just trying to cover the fact that they're not going through structural reform. So I think that's that's his uh, that's his strategy. On the issue of uh, of national identity, clearly, first he doesn't like the term identity. Uh, he says he uses the term appartenance, which means belonging. I would say, um, and the difference that he makes is he does talk about identity a lot. It's interesting, but he, uh, the way he phrases it is to say the, the National Front has a passiest, very close-minded view of identity that's basically you know rigid and stopped. Uh, and he says I consider that you know identity or belonging is, is still fluid. It's still forward-looking. Um, that we can have you know diversity and a lot of influence um, coming in. Um, so, you know, what, what I find interesting in, in his discourse as well that responds very well to the one on the National Front is that he, once again, he is um, he's not eluding these, these issues. He's not only making a technocratic case for reform or saying protectionism won't work. He's really trying to make a value-based argument in favor of this with a very uh, 
positive um, message in, uh, in his campaign. It is a huge gamble because the country uh, suffers once again from high unemployment, has gone through terrorist attacks in the last few years. The, there's not necessarily a lot of political momentum for optimism and for a positive message on, uh, on these issues. The campaign, uh, you know, which, which, as I said, has been stuck in, in, in a very negative tone and it's becoming very nasty and personal and obviously focused a lot on the, on the scandal, has not made that easy. And obviously one of the big challenges for him, if he were to get elected, uh, would be to gather a majority at, uh, at the National Assembly a month later with uh, candidates that will be mostly new faces, very few incumbents. Uh, from a party that um, that is uh, that is quite new, so I think you know that that would be the the, the challenges for uh, for Macron. And just a quick word on the two other candidates: if Fillon were to get to the second round, were to win, uh, you would have a traditional Republican conservative uh, candidate. He would probably win then after the National Assembly, uh, just by virtue of having. 577 candidates who are already ready and who are, for a lot of them, already you know known known faces and have uh, local uh, local roots, um, and it wouldn't be a huge break from the years of Sarkozy, except probably on foreign policy, where uh, Fillon is uh, is uh, actually quite friendly with Putin that he he met when he was prime minister and Putin was uh, Medvedev's prime minister. But apart from this, I think you know you, you wouldn't see a, a lot of a lot of change. But clearly, it would install, a, uh, I would say, a nasty political atmosphere with someone who would have very little legitimacy to ask the French to do, uh, you know, efforts and tighten the belt for reforms after uh, what he went through in the, in the campaign. And, and finally, Mélenchon is, uh, is much more of an unknown quantity, I think, on many dimensions, except the one on migration and, and national identity, he would be quite close to Le Pen. It's a controversial thing to say. A lot of people don't necessarily agree with me, but you would have a vast increase in public spending and taxation, uh, clearly getting out of the Euro, uh, Euro the European Union, NATO, uh, much stronger ties with Russia, um, and probably deep institutional rearrangement um, to try to maybe, he says, limit the powers of the presidency, have a, um, a, a different system where, you know, uh, based more on, on referendum, more on, on, on you know, giving power to people and, and even having um, uh, just regular citizens sit in a, at the National Assembly. Uh, but I, I think it's still unlikely, despite the impressive momentum that his campaign has gathered in the last couple of weeks, I think it's still unlikely to see him uh, uh, get to the presidency. But, you know, once again, we, we've we just witnessed a couple of years uh, that were very unpredictable politically. So I say this with a huge amount of uh, precaution, and I'll stop here. Thank you so much for giving us that intricate look into uh, into this campaign and uh, and posing some provocative questions about um, you know how how this phenomenon of populism on the left and the right is manifesting itself in French politics. We're going to turn to Dimitri now to help us sort of take a step back and carry this theme into what we can expect from other European elections and what we've, what we've learned from the U.S. experience as well um, in terms of how immigration fits into all of this. Dimitri. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Natalia, and uh, very nice listening to you, Benjamin. So I will make three general observations that flow out of your presentation, and then I will ask um, three questions because um, I may not be. I may be in the minority about among people who don't know uh, what um, will actually happen. Uh, I don't think anyone does, but I seem to be even more agnostic than most uh, because um, too many of the results of recent elections are completely unpredictable, and because polling has become almost an irrelevance. And um, even the polling of polls, you know, tends to be very unreliable, and it has been so in the last several important elections, whether it's Brexit or the U.S. election, uh, etc. Uh, the first point is a simple one, and it's something that you have already alluded, but I'll put it in different words. 
that there is no such thing as an attractive candidate among the five people uh, that are you know, uh, the major uh, protagonists uh, in, the, in the French uh, election. Nobody who is going to have guaranteed support, not even across the board, that's next to impossible, but even guaranteed support among very substantial segments of the society. There's something terribly unappealing about the two leading candidates. I find it very hard to believe that you know, Macron, with his kinds of, uh, of um, reforms, can appeal to unionists, you know, for that matter, to working people more generally. Uh, and, of course, Le Pen has her base, but it will be difficult for me to see how she can go beyond her base. And I, by base, I don't mean the people who are fundamentally in ideological accord of what her party has stood for and what she stands for, for, but also, you know, about the constituencies that you refer to that people don't really um, pay attention to, which is um, the young people whose future has been very bleak and continues to be bleak, and I'll say a couple of things about that later. And of course, you know, the people over 50, you know, we're forgetting the part of the reason if you're not Benjamin in your presentation, but people typically forget that there are these forgotten people in all of our electorates that have been responsible for the unusual election, electoral results that we have experienced in recent years. The second point that I want to make is France, more than perhaps, and here I have to be careful, um, more than most other places in Europe. Uh, I'm sure there are always one or two examples, so I have to allow for those examples. Uh, is experiencing to a very deep degree all of the fragmentation and cleavages that European societies um, uh, uh, experience. Uh, it's hard to see uh, here in the United States um, where the anti-Washington establishment <laughs> is attacked by all sides, so maybe today we can't see that, but it's hard to understand, you know, the, the long divisions between Paris and big cities more generally in the countryside, between central cities where all of the activism and all of the culture and all of the opportunities are and their surrounding areas, the banlieue or whatever it is, you know, that's, you know, a particular cleavage for France. Um, the divisions between capital and workers is, of course, fairly common, So, but it plays so much more interestingly in France than I suspect in any other place. There is no other place where somebody makes just a, a proposal, a legislative proposal, and all of the tractors, you know, and all of the peasants meaning the people who work in the agricultural industry will take to the streets and block Paris. You don't have those things. I noticed that Greece actually has had some of that five or ten years ago, but Greece is, you know, an irrelevance when it comes to Europe, I suspect, at this time. And, of course, there is something else that is going on in France that's fairly common in the rest of Europe, which is the repudiation of mainstream parties. Uh, the loss of trust in the political establishment is one of the defining feature, features of today's Europe. And it seems that no one is taking that anywhere near as seriously as they should. Because once you lose trust, it takes extraordinary effort to claw yourself back from that. And of course, you know, the typical something else that's fairly typical, but also plays more vividly in France, is the idea of protectionism. You know, and I mean by protectionism, uh, I use it in a very inclusive way, which is everything from, you know, culture to to jobs to, you know, belt and shang and, you know, these views of the world, et cetera, et cetera, versus openness. And I don't think, except perhaps for public intellectuals, that France has been a paragon of openness, um, regardless of what he may have done with regard to the creation of the European Union or not. The third point that I want to make is that, and you mentioned part of this, uh, Benjamin, is that either Le Pen or Macron, whoever wins, well, whoever, 
is a candidate that will surprise us all. We'll have to start from scratch because they don't have political parties that have or are likely to have nearly as much representation in the National Assembly as the more traditional parties would have. And now you made a point, I think a correct point, that um, there is a tendency for the person that wins, particularly since they will win with a substantial margin, um, perhaps in this election too, um, uh, there's a you know sort of a bias on the part of the electorate of sending an awful lot of people from that party to the National Assembly. Uh, I do not know how this will work out. I don't think that uh, Le Pen is likely to be able to put together a coalition that will allow her to govern. Macron may be a better at that, but you know this is also to be seen. So I suspect that governing, as we have found out in the United States, is an entirely different thing than running for office. And that is something that I think that we should be watching for. So making this, you know, sort of fairly simple points, I want to raise a couple of questions, three of them in fact, that that may be relevant over the next two weeks and certainly the two weeks after that. Um, yeah, whenever it is the 20-something and the 7th. Is it next week, the 23rd of the election? My gosh, it's not two weeks. It's next week already. 11 uh, days. <laughs> Eleven, oh, my God. Another you, have, you have a countdown clock, I can tell. Um, as, um, as we look at the data, particularly the economic data in Europe, um, there has been a bit of a surprise in the sense that Europe is doing better economically than it was doing, let's say, a mere six months ago or a year ago. Um, the growth is not phenomenal, you know, uh, a few countries are doing better than other countries, but there is economic growth. You know, the economic growth for the last year in 2016 for France was 1.2 percent, not enough to make any difference, but certainly, you know, after many years of of complete flatness, you know, this is progress, and progress is progress. So if indeed that progress continues and it gradually embraces or is embraced, you know, in, in, um, in France too, um, this global reflation, which is what uh, Ken Rogoff from Harvard calls it, uh, can undermine the, or support in a sense, by undermining the economic argument that things are terrible, and to the extent that economics plays a role and does, the same way that social policy and access to a good social protection system also plays a role. The question is, is this going to make any difference in the election? My sense is that it is too early for it to make any difference. Youth unemployment is at ridiculously high rate. It's not about youth unemployment only, 24, 25 percent. It's about the fact that every year that passes, the people who didn't find a job the year before or the year before that are added to the people who are just entering the workforce. The new cohorts, in other words, will compete for jobs with people who haven't found a job for several years. It's all about an economic ladder. These folks will not be able, haven't been able, and will find it very, very hard to sort of get to that first step of the ladder, which then can allow them to have a decent economic and social life, family life. And what I am not certain about, and I think one of the questions that we have to, um, to be asking ourselves and watching well after the election, is whether this lost generation of young people will actually be able to re-enter the mainstream or not. Because the reason that these young people are voting for, for Le Pen, um, think of the two constituencies that are supporting her, in addition to the ideological fellow travelers, are people over 50 who got very hurt over the past many years, and people under 25 who haven't been able to, um, to see themselves as having you know, an opportunity to do well economically in this, under these circumstances. The second question, and this may play a, a role in a significant way, is trying to see and guess, I guess after the election we'll know the answer to that, 
what the effect of the dramatic easing of the migration crisis is. Uh, you know, I don't care whether in the abstract Macron is, you know, pro-refugees. That's an irrelevance. Uh, we know that, you know, uh, Madame Le Pen has made, you know, and of course her party has been the principal skeptic uh, about migration more generally, and I suspect including refugees, the way that refugees have been coming to Europe in recent years. So, when you look at the data, you realize that there's a dramatic change in all of this, the migration crisis of the second half of 2015 and the early parts of 2016 has not only eased, it's, you know, there's a sense that, you know, it has abated. If you really think and look at the data um, from, let's say, the summer of 15 to March of 16, there were somewhere between 50 and 80,000 people per month that were entering Europe via the Aegean. The Aegean now has about 1,500 people total that enter through the Aegean. And although in the last half of 2016 and 15 and early parts of 2016, you know, we had an abatement, a significant one, of people who are trying, who are trying to come in through the central Mediterranean, the fact is that in a sense, there is a new normal in the central Mediterranean, if you look at the last three years or so, which suggests that Europe, unless they do some of the things that they have been talking about in the last three months, uh, will continue to get something like in the neighborhood of about 10,000 people per month that will be trying to come into Europe. This is a management, a managing, manageable um, a number. Uh, particularly if, you know, the public understands that the crisis, the crisis has abated and now countries can actually uh, sort of think creatively and with cooler heads about how to deal with this 150 or 200,000 people who will be coming in. And the third question is, flows from these um, first two questions. So if the economy is beginning to do better, and if social protections continue to be very strong in France and most of the rest of Europe, um, and if the migration crisis that has abated continues to abate, um, how will all of this progress affect how people think about the things that concern them? Will it get to the point where it will affect their electoral behavior, will it matter, in other words? And I suspect that, no, it's too early for this to matter with the possible exception of the migration crisis. So uh, these are the kinds of things, you know, that I think uh, if I were a French voter, I would have, you know, in my mind. And of course, these are not um, the kinds of issues that others are not concerned about in, in the rest of Europe. At the end of the day, all politics, it's an, an American aphorism that stands, you know, um, is uh, also holds true for most other places. All politics are local, national and local, but local more than anything else. And I suspect that we're going to have, we're going to see over the, ne over the rest of the year, depending on the results of, in France, uh, that some of the extreme passions that animated the, uh, you know, the populist parties of the right in Europe over the past year and a half are actually likely to sort of uh, relax a little bit. This is what we saw with the alternative for Germany in the last elections. As you know, Germany has two or three very important local elections, whatever, you know, state elections uh, that in many ways may give us a hint as to what um, is likely to happen in the German elections in the end of September. And there are some other unknowns involving the Italian election. I do not know that Italy will, the current government will survive until, you know, next year when the election will take place. We may have a fairly sudden Italian election, which is likely to complicate matters rather than clarify matters. But, you know, we have some important elections over the next 12 months, 
which will give us a better idea about both the promise and the performance from populist parties of the left or the right. Thank you so much, Dimitri, um, for giving us some, some food for thought. Uh, we've gotten some great questions from our listeners, um, but I just want to um, give Benjamin two minutes to respond to something you just said, Dimitri, and I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on whether the abatement of the crisis uh, is going to affect support for populism, or is what really matters a relative sense of insecurity, whether we're talking about social, economic, or security, you know, terrorism-related um, insecurity, which can actually be stoked by opportunistic politicians regardless of the absolute data? Um, and if so, does their power actually derive from being outsiders, outside of um, holding actual political and governing power. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, a, a few reactions to uh, what you said. So I, I do think it is too early for uh, the improvement of the economic data to have a, a, a major impact on this election, and especially because France has been largely immune from this improvement, uh, you know, mostly because the incumbent government has not been very uh, effective at reforming the country's economy. Uh, France is the only Eurozone country whose uh, unemployment has uh, not decreased in the last a few years. It is doing slightly better in the last couple of months, but I don't have, I don't think it will have um, a major a major impact. And I would add that you have to dissociate also the macro from the, the micro in the sense that even if you see growth uh, coming back, uh, the real issue is that a lot of people can't get into the job market. Or they only go to the, come to the periphery of the job market with part-time jobs, with uh, short-term contracts. Uh, we have a system that is very based on an insider-outsider um, um, system, you know, way of functioning where if you come from the right families, if you have the right degree, if you have the right connection, then you get long-term contracts that are very protected, uh, that are very comfortable, very secure in France, way more than most countries. If you don't, if you're too young, if you're too old, or if you don't have the right degrees, then you spend most of your life just sort of circulating around the, the job market. So I think the, the solution to this is to make it more fluid. On the easing of the migration crisis, first, I don't think the migration crisis was as heated an issue in France as it was in Germany, for obvious reasons, because Merkel made the decisions that she made. Uh, France agreed to a quota of 35,000 uh, refugees. It was a uh, actually a decision that was mostly supported by a majority of the French population, even, uh, even though obviously the National Front um, campaign against it. When we talk about migration and identity in France, we're obviously talking about uh, the millions of French citizens who came decades ago, whose parents or grandparents came decades ago. And the irony, by the way, in this debate is when Marine Le Pen is talking about immigration, it's not really the issue. You look at the data of people coming in France, it's actually lower than most countries in a lot of countries in Europe. The real issue is integrating people whose grandparents have come in the 1960s. So it's much more of an integration slash identity issue with a mix of, of you know, efforts at education, at opening the job market, but also, and I would say, at, at, at finding uh, the true rise of, of a form of, of radical Islamism within um, uh, the Muslim community, uh, especially among, among the youth, that has been an issue in France in the last couple of years. Um, so it, it, most candidates, most mainstream candidates, are trying to find a balance between um, um, promoting integration and at the same time being extremely firm on, on en enforcing French secularism and, and uh, fighting, for example, foreign funding of, of radical mosques and, and issues like this. And it's a very difficult uh, issue to balance without obviously falling prey to the uh, easy-made solutions of the, uh, of the uh, extreme right. Um, I would just say one, on, on one point, because maybe I didn't make it clear enough uh, in, my, in my presentation on what you call the uh, uh, the collapse of the reputation of mainstream parties of traditional parties. And it is true that if you look at the current polling, uh, you would have François Fillon, the Republican candidate, is third or fourth, and then you have uh, Benoît Hamon, the socialist, who is fifth, which means that the two parties that have structured French political life for the last 40 years wouldn't, wouldn't even be close to making it to the second round. And it's true that it's revolutionary. Now, I would say, you know, it's not entirely negative in the sense that it is understandable that once the issues that structure the political debate change, and I think they have changed, I think it is about the relation to Europe, the relation to globalization, 
you see that the two traditional parties are uh, so internally divided on this that it's much more complicated for them to make a clear case. Um, the Socialist Party has always been divided between a more, I would say, socialist in the American sense, a, 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 a much more uh, um, left-wing, immune to reform, anti-European wing, and a much more uh, a free market Blairite wing that was embodied by uh, someone like uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, for example, a few years ago, or to a certain extent by François Hollande himself, even though he, he's always been trying to have it, have it both ways and balance out, which I think is the, the main cause of failure of his, uh, of his presidency. And same thing on the right. You look at two of the major figures of the right, François Fillon, the current candidate, was campaigning against any European referendum, any advance in, in Europe. He was against the Euro 25 years ago, even though he's much more pragmatic now. Um, and Alain Juppé was a centrist, liberal, pro-European. There are a lot of divisions, there are a lot of differences. And I think the reason why these parties are collapsing beyond the scandal is, is precisely because they're so internally divided on the issues that, that really structure. So it, it is not so surprising to see new faces uh, and, and, and new parties emerging and maybe We'll see to what extent this is long-term. We'll see if they replace them. And you're completely right to say that the real test might not be the presidential election, but indeed the parliamentary election and their ability to gather a majority. I think it will probably be easier for Macron if uh, he wins the presidential election. I think people will be attracted to the fact that he's promoting a lot of new faces and will give him momentum. It will be more complicated for Le Pen for two reasons. First, because you do need to get a absolute majority in, um, well, it, the system is actually more complicated, but basically you need to get a majority in, you know, most districts. It, it's not a it's not a proportional election. There's 577 districts, so it's it, you know, it's one thing to get a give a majority to Le Pen. It's it's already a pretty um, unlikely, but to give it to you know, 300 candidates, it's another thing, especially because the Le Pen vote is very concentrated geographically. She's very popular in areas of north, in areas of southeast, the Marseille region, but less in, in I would say, the rest of uh, the country. Thank you so much. Um, we we have some great questions from our audience um, about what drives the immigration discontent that appeared earlier on in our chat, and I think that those have been really richly answered so far. So I'm going to skip to another question, and I'll direct this to you, Dimitri. Um, what can policymakers do to assuage these discontents surrounding immigration? I gave you the easy one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm grateful to you and to the questionnaire. <laughs> um, I think that what has happened in the past um, in the past several years, you know, this is there's always an undercurrent of discontent with the status quo on immigration in every country. Um, if people were not opening enough to immigration, there were demands to open up more. If the opening was too wide, there were always a reaction saying that the opening is too wide for all of the reasons that we understand, because they bring about all sorts of change at a rate that a certain part of the population finds too fast, in other words, too many and too soon. And as a result, you basically create segments of the population that they organize themselves um, in, um, in opposition to the status quo on immigration. Uh, but immigration alone has never and will never be able to explain what happens in the political realm. It has to attach itself to unhappiness, as it were, with other parts of how governments and societies are organized. Uh, the most common, most recent way of, uh, of um, uh, you know, analysts, or at least the people who speak in television, <laughs> tend to describe it is about unhappiness with globalization, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that also plays a role. After all, you know, immigration and immigrants in particular are the face of change that is brought from abroad. You put that together, you know, with how people experience immigration and experience globalization and with the inattention, systematic inattention on the part of most governments, with very few exceptions, to appreciate the fact that globalization and openness has weaker winners and losers 
and that you need to systematically pay attention, as much attention to the losers as you pay to the winners, and invest in the kinds of things that Benjamin talked about, you know, that Macron is promising, and invest in, with heart, systematically, in training, but not training for the sake of training, but training for jobs. It makes no difference how much training you do. You, you're going to have to persuade people to invest in creating jobs. And that doesn't happen in sclerotic systems like the French system. So we had a long haul before we get to a better place on this. But if certain of the other things you know, are addressed, we will do better with immigration than we have done in the past two or three years. Immigration is easy to exploit. It's part of the opportunism of unhappy parties, whether they are the left or the right. But there are other things, you know, that contribute to the same sort of unhappiness. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here um, that, that draws on what you, Benjamin, were saying about how Macron has actually tried to make a values-based argument for, for his economic platform. Um, and an audience member um, was specifically asking about the negative rhetoric used so often in these campaigns, particularly in France right now. And, and so the question is, you know, why is it so much more powerful to stoke fear than to try to create uh, a positive narrative? Um, why has this been so difficult? And, you know, what would happen um, if Macron actually succeeds with this sort of stop the, some of the contagion effect? You know, 30 years ago, uh, Laurent Fabius, a French politician uh, who's been around for a long time, said uh, the National Front asks the right question but gives the wrong answers. And the reason why the populist the National Front has been so successful, and we have to be blunt in addressing it, is that some of the issues that they've raised have become central issues. They have, you know, when they talk about the rise of, of radicalism in the country, it is true that the country has been going through uh, terrorist attacks in some neighborhoods where you have, you know, uh, Salafism that is uh, very, uh, very popular on the rise. Uh, it is true that uh, the the euro, uh, the way it is it is structured, is incomplete. Uh, it is not completely uh, effective. Um, it is true that the uh, borders of the European Union have been porous and have been ineffective. And so they do instill fear, but they also, uh, you know put at center stage issues that sometimes have been have been taboo, have been uh, unpopular among the elite or the, the politician, and then they hijack it with their own uh, agenda of, of, you know, as you say, a fear of, um, of nationalism. So the reason why a pessimistic and nostalgic and protectionist case for France is so popular, it's because objectively things haven't been so great in the last, uh, in the last couple of years, and I think it's important to, to say so. One, other approach that I think Macron is trying to develop is to indeed, uh, uh, you know, talk about these issues, but frame them in a, in a, I wouldn't say a more positive way, more more optimistic way, more more forward-looking narrative. You offer solution, but at the same time you frame it in the uh, in the sort of uh, open uh, narrative. So, will, will it work? I mean, it, it has clearly created a lot of enthusiasm and momentum uh, around him. Uh, he is. You know, as Dimitri said, like everyone else, an imperfect candidate, an imperfect politician, whatever you want to say. But it, it is still quite striking that a figure that a year ago didn't even have a political party is now widely considered to be the front runner for uh, for the race. So, if you want to see glass half full, it is it is quite a still an interesting uh, phenomenon, I would say. Thank you. And Dimitri, do you want to give a, a an answer, a final answer to this? <laughs> No, but I do want to make three, fine, four final uh, comments very briefly because I think that we're approaching you know, Indeed we are. the midnight hour, right? <laughs> the first one, I, I think that um, Benjamin is exactly right about the integration point. Uh, but integration always reflects failures of the past, and we live in the past. And that, in a sense, uh, makes dealing with some of these issues, you know, much more difficult than it needs to be. Second point is, you know, the reason that some of the reasons that people are unhappy with the immigration end of it, which is not 
you know, as Benjamin, I think, was persuasively able to explain, it's not the critical issue. The newcomers is not the critical issue in in, um, in France, uh, but it will be a very critical issue in some of the other places, the other elections that we're having. Is uh, There are three things. The first one is the chaotic way in which the, the flows grew. I mean, the idea that the visuals of it alone, that you, as far as the eye can see, you see phalanxes of people, you know, moving toward Europe. It has a destabilizing effect. I don't care whether, you know, this is the, you know, the, the correct thing to say or not. The fact is, chaos always creates fears, and fears is what drives people's um, uh, uh, choices in elections. The second one is illegality. It used to be illegality just in the United States, where we have a quarter of all people who are foreign-born in the country being here illegally. This is, you know, a very high percentage of all the people who are foreign-born in the United States. But illegality now, of a different type, is actually quite prevalent in Europe, too. Um, there was a parliamentary question in the German parliament in recent, last year, in fact, that forced the government to divulge how many people whose claims have been found to be ineligible for staying in Germany are still in Germany. It's over half a million people. Again, they may not be as visible as some of the unauthorized population is in the United States. They certainly are not organizing themselves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the fact is, you know, that you have now rampant illegality in different parts uh, of Europe. The third one, of course, is when immigration growth is out of the ordinary, including legal immigration. A perfect example that we have of this, of course, is Spain, that grew its legal immigration from a few percentages in the beginning of this century to about 14% six or eight years later. This is an absolutely unfathomable rate of growth. And people, you know, feel, despite the fact that we don't have an anti-immigration party in Spain, feel that that kind of growth suggests that there's lack of control, lack of forethought, lack of trying to figure out what are the next steps. Okay, you open up, okay? Can your institutions change in a way that can accommodate this growth? Can people sort of embrace the newcomers, etc.? So these are the kinds of things that Europe will continue to deal with in 12 to 18 months. Thank you. Um, I think that's a very powerful note for us to end on. Um, and we have, in fact, uh, reached the end of our hour here. Um, so I want to thank you all for, for listening to us and for submitting um, such great questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them. We got to as many as we could in the time provided. Um, I want to give a big thanks to our two speakers um, for providing such rich remarks and insights um, that I think have been uh, very helpful um, and I hope uh, have been helpful to everybody listening as well. Um, just a reminder that the audio from today's webinar will be available on our website, uh, migrationpolicy.org. Um, as well as a number of related publications and resources, um, the specific uh, addresses of which are, are listed on your last slide there. Um, so with that, thank you very much, and we hope you'll join us next time.